I'm delighted and honored to turn the podium over to Judith Creed, who's going to introduce our speaker. Um, Judith is one of our amazing board members, and she is not only amazing in that capacity, she is the founder and the leader of J High, a very important Philadelphia-based nonprofit organization that enables people with disabilities to live in the community, to have independent housing and supports, and over 70% of the people that she serves have jobs, despite the fact that in this country only th one in three people with a disability have a job. So this is one of the model programs that we're always showcasing. Uh, she and her husband, Robert Schwartz, have the Schwartz Foundation, which is one of the most important education funders in Philadelphia and in New Jersey. And so I turn it over to my fellow board member, Judith Creed, to introduce our fabulous first speaker. I don't think I've ever been introduced before. I always do the introducing. Thank you, Jennifer. Well, I'm assuming that everybody in this room knows respectability and what respectability does and their formidable uh, founder, Jennifer Mizrahi. I think you all know that respectability represents an organization that fosters inclusion in education and the workspace and is trying to move the needle on the way people perceive other people with disabilities, that they perceive the capabilities of people with disabilities. But I'm sure what you don't know is what Johnny Collette does. And Johnny Collette does the same thing, only he's been doing it for his entire life. Johnny Collette, and some things I have to read here so I don't get it wrong. Johnny Collette is the Assistant Secretary for Special Education and Rehabilitation Services at the United States Department of Education. So, let me just say that his influence now is on the whole country. But when he was younger, he started doing this on a Kentucky local level. Level. He was a former high school special ed teacher. He was, Kentucky, he was Kentucky's director of special ed and the program director of special ed outcomes and the Council of Chief State School Officers. Well, that's a long life of doing good and caring about and having compassion for people with disabilities. Think about it. And think about how good he was at this job so that now he can influence the whole country on helping people see people with different disabilities in a different, more positive light. His actual mandate is he serves as the advisor to the U.S. Education Secretary on matters related to the education of children and youth with disabilities, as well as employment and community living for youth and adults with disabilities. The mission of his office is to improve early childhood educational and employment outcomes and to raise expectations for all people with disabilities, their families, their communities, and now the nation. And you know, oh, I'm gonna sneeze. <laughs> and you know, we're very lucky. Some people get jobs just because they know somebody. This man has gotten this job because of all of his knowledge and capacity and record for achieving these goals. So I'm really honored and excited to be introducing Johnny Collette that I've never met before, but I'm hoping I will keep in contact with him for the rest of all of our lives because he's standing with us. Johnny Collette? Good morning. 
Well, Carlos, thank you very much. I don't know where you are, but thank you so much for, um, it's all, hey, there you are. It's nice to see you and thank you so much. Um, I'm always moved by our national anthem, so I was moved again today. Carlos, thank you very much for that. Judy, thank you for the invitation, and uh, Jennifer, thank you as well, and the board uh, here at Respectability. I think that uh, Jennifer and I first met at my confirmation hearing, not far from here, and uh, we've met a couple of times since then, and it's been great to get to know her and to get to know your work here at Respectability, and we're excited to be able to share with you today a little bit about what is driving us in terms of values and thoughts at the, now hang with me here, okay, it's a really long title, the Office of Special Education and Rehabilitative Services. So I'm just going to say OSERS from here on out. Is that okay with you? I promise it'll save you and me a lot of time. Uh, so I'm excited to talk to you about that. I want to recognize our Deputy Assistant Secretary, Kim Ritchie, who's also here. And, uh, and thank you uh, on behalf of Education Secretary Betsy DeVos for this invitation. Secretary DeVos could not be here uh, today to enjoy this day with you, but we are incredibly excited to to be here representing her and representing our work at the Department of Education. So let me share for a few moments about, again, what is guiding our thoughts, key values for us as we think about the millions of children, youth, and adults with disabilities across our country that we serve every day. OSERS is committed to improving outcomes and raising expe expectations for all people with disabilities, their families, their communities, and the nation. Uh, one of the things I say very often and I hope that you will remember today uh, from our time together is while we are committed to improving outcomes for all individuals, what that means for us and I think for all of us is to be mindful that there's really only one way to do that. The only way to improve outcomes for all individuals is to be mindful of the particular needs of each individual. The math simply does not work any other way. So we are deeply committed to that. And as I speak today for these few moments, I hope a couple of things will be clear. I hope it will be clear that I believe that high expectations are not negotiable. So in other words, I'm not gonna have a debate or a long conversation with someone about whether or not we should have high expectations for each and every individual. I believe that high expectations are non-negotiable. But I also believe that those are individually realized. And I think both of those things matter a lot. I hope it will be equally clear, and I'm not gonna, I don't mean this to sound negative at all, so I hope you hear me. I hope it'll be equally clear that I have a low tolerance for two things. So here they are. I have a low tolerance for low expectations for individuals with disabilities. And, and connected to that, I have a low tolerance for adults in a system who cannot figure out how to work together on their behalf at any level. So when you put those two things together, that's really what I hope you remember from today is, okay, well, he said a lot of things, but I think he has high expectations for each individual and he's really gonna try to model and push folks working together collaboratively across systems to improve outcomes for each individual. Uh, you guys are familiar, I'm sure, with an individualized education program. Many of you have heard of IEPs in schools. Uh, well, I was a high school teacher and I remember one of my first IEP team meetings was my student's last IEP team meeting. So he was transitioning out of high school and moving on to what was next for him in his life. And I remember that meeting and at the end of it, we handed him this massive binder. And it was just this huge binder of an inordinate number of names and contact information for people that he might reach out to if he continued to need help after he left high school. So I, have, I didn't think about that as much then as I have since, but I promise every day in one way or the other I think about this. While that was, the, that was better than nothing, to have handed him this binder with all these names, all this contact information, hey, if you need anything, call these people, whoever these people are. While that was better than nothing, I became convinced very soon after that that it was not the best we could have done to support him and his transition needs after he left high school. So I became driven 
from that moment on to make sure that from wherever I was leading, that I involved all the relevant actors as early and as consistently as possible so that we could make sure we were providing the best services to students with disabilities that we served. And then when I went to work at the State Department of Education, that continued. And I began thinking about how we could model at a State Department of Education the kind of collaboration that's really necessary to lead change in a, at a local level. But we didn't stop there. Uh, we knew that it wasn't good enough for us at a State Department of Education just to think about these things. We needed to be very intentional about how we were working with other state child-serving agencies. So I had many opportunities and routine opportunities to meet with heads of other child-serving agencies in our state. And that same commitment to meaningful and, a coll and effective collaboration with all those who have a stake in the success of individuals with disabilities is something that continued when I was at the State Department of Education. So uh, it was really an obligation that compelled me. And then when we were meeting together, all these individual agencies were beginning to think about continuous improvement. They were beginning to think about how do we get better in our state agencies at the work that we do. Uh, so as we sat around tables and had really important meetings about the, the issues facing individuals in our state and started to try to problem solve some of those issues, there were a couple of things that became immediately significant to us. And those two things probably is not lost on this group, but it was just one day in a meeting, it just sort of rested on us and we're like, wow, I wish we could have come to this sooner, but I'm really glad we figured it out. So we're sitting with all these different agencies around the table and two significant things occurred to us. Number one, we were serving the same kids, right? So I called them a student. Someone at the end of the table called them a client. Someone over there called them an incarcerated youth. Over here, they, they called them a patient. Over here, they called them a job seeker. Turns out we were serving the same kids and families. That was one thing that occurred to us. And the second thing that occurred to us because of that is that we could not be content to just get better in isolation. That's what we were doing. We were getting better, but we were getting better in isolation. So what we determined is that might lead to isolated impact, but what, what kind of collective impact might we have if we could really figure out how to work together across state child serving agencies? So that was something that has just been a, a key part of my life and my career, and it's something that continues to inform me in this role uh, through which we, we get to lead now. So we started at the state to rethink what we did and, when, and, and how we did it and to question everything. And I believe when we started to think that way and to rethink the things that we did and how we did it and when we did it and with whom we did it, it really put us in a position to better serve individuals in our care. So during this time, I also learned a number of things that, that I wanted to share with you today. Uh, again, that continue to inform the work that we're leading at OSERS and the values we have and the thoughts that we are applying to particular issues that we face. So during this time that I was just sharing about, there were several other things that, that I learned that I wanna share with you. And the first is this, meaningful and effective collaboration with all those who have a stake in the success of individuals with disabilities is critical to them achieving the success that we envision, and most importantly, they envision. So meaningful and effective collaboration, that's why partnerships like this are so important to us. And meeting with folks like you and, and getting to learn the work that you lead and the unique perspectives that you bring and the particular expertise that you bring uh, is incredibly important to us. We are deeply committed to meaningful and effective collaboration with those who have a stake in the success of individuals with disabilities. Another thing that resonated with me back then that still uh, stays on my mind today is, is that it's not just about working hard, right? This work that we do, it's not just about working hard. I don't know anybody who doesn't work hard. So if it was just about working hard, we would have probably already achieved our goals by now, or maybe a lot more than we have or wish we had. So working hard is important. I believe in working hard. But it's not just about working hard. Working hard is not going to get us to our goals. What's going to get us closer to our goals is working differently and more collaboratively. right? So it's not just about working hard. It's about working differently and more collaboratively. Another thing that resonated with me then and still does and I hope to, does with you in some way is that, th that our work is about preparing individuals 
It's not about protecting turf. Sometimes I get in conversations and I'm not real sure what's being advocated for here. Is it the individual or is it someone's particular agenda, right? So I don't, you may already know, I don't do well in those meetings. Because if the focus isn't on the individual, then I'm gonna start asking questions, right? So this is, this is about preparing individuals. It's not about protecting turf. It's about each individual and their needs. It's about rethinking and questioning anything that puts us in a position to better serve them. So it is about what's best for individuals. It's not what's convenient for those around the individuals, right? Because it won't always be convenient. It won't always be comfortable. It will be difficult. It will be messy. It will require change. But one of the things we believe is that that kind of approach and commitment might just be right. And this might just be a time for us to be able to do that together, maybe like we've not before. So let me share a few other things again that are important to us. And I think it's, it's fair for you to know what's on our minds as we lead this work at the Department of Education, specifically in the Office of Special Education and Rehabilitative Services. In our efforts to raise expectations and improve outcomes for each individual, in our country, I'm firmly convinced that what I call tinkering around the edges is not gonna get us there. Just tweaking stuff, tinkering, it's not gonna get us there. It's not gonna be enough to address the challenges we face and it's not gonna be sufficient to truly embrace the opportunities that I think we have. So I believe that we must demonstrate the courage and persistence necessary to make needed changes at the federal, state, and local levels if we're going to really see the success that we envision, and again, most importantly, the individuals we serve envision. If anybody in here been engaged in any level of systems change before? Yeah, yeah, others of you have, you're just too tired to admit it. <laughs> it's because system change is hard, right? I mean, there's nothing about, I always say, if somebody ever comes to you and tries to sell you something that says systems, let me help you with systems change and it's gonna be easy, good indicator of who not to talk to much longer, right? So systems change is hard. Uh, it doesn't happen quickly. It's not accomplished by just a few, but, uh, but it's worth it because at the heart of the system are the individuals that we serve and individuals that are, might be you at the heart of that system, individuals we serve and their futures. That's why it's worth it. Um, and the work is too important the need is too urgent and the stakes are too high, we believe, to settle for anything less than whatever it takes to deliver on the promises that we've made to individuals and families in our country. And that's a commitment we have at OSERS, and I hope you'll help us in and hope, hope you'll help hold us accountable for as well. So let me uh, try to conclude here. I'm afraid I'm gonna run out of time, but this notion of a whatever it takes commitment, what might that look like? I want to suggest a few things that we are thinking about each day. But whatever it takes commitment will address that we will mean that we have to address deeply embedded and complex issues. Nothing about this is going to be easy. Nobody knows that better than you. You've done this. You continue to do this. You, you lead this every day in work that you've done, in work that you're conceptualizing, in, in innovations that you are a part of. Nobody knows better than you, perhaps, that this is certainly not going to be easy and we're gonna to have to address some deeply embedded and complex issues. Let me suggest a few of those from my perspective. One of those, uh, some of those might be the systems that do not facilitate the kind of improvement that we know is necessary. Structures that limit opportunities for individuals with disabilities. We have to address this. We have to address policies and practices that put the needs of a system over the needs of an individual. From my perspective, not okay, right? We have to address laws and regulations that don't provide enough flexibility to states, to districts, to schools, to parents, to others. It doesn't provide enough flexibility to be innovative, to dream, and to try things that, that may challenge the status quo. And then perhaps the most difficult we're gonna to have to address even mindsets that are opposed to any notion of a challenge to special education in this country. So 
I hope you're hearing from me and again will help hold me accountable for. These are issues that we are thinking about and where do we add value in these conversations. But my commitment to address these deeply complex and embedded issues on behalf of individuals with disabilities, my commitment to that is unwavering. And I'm excited to continue to do this work. These are all issues that affect kids and families across our country, right? These things we struggle with, these things that are hard. They're all issues that impact and affect kids and families across our country. But what I always say to groups like this and partners like you <laughs> is while these are issues that affect kids and families, they're not kids and families' problems to solve. They're our problems to solve on behalf of kids and families. That's why we at the federal and state and local levels have to figure out how to work together. Remember, one of my what's one of the things I have a really low tolerance for? Low expectations is one. What's the second one? Yeah, right. Yeah, when adults in a system cannot figure out how to work together on behalf of individuals and families, I just can't manage that long in my head, right? Again, the work's too important, the need is too urgent, the stakes are too high for us to continue not doing this well together. So we're deeply committed to this. Um, none of us want to watch. None of us want to watch another generation of kids fail to achieve the outcomes they could have achieved just because the adults in a system couldn't figure these things out. So I'm not questioning how hard it is. I will never question how hard it is. I know how hard it is. I'm just suggesting that how hard it is is not the question. The question is, will we demonstrate the courage and persistence necessary to make changes at the federal, state, and local levels that may be needed for us to really support individuals with disabilities in this country to the outcomes that they dream and want to achieve. So everywhere I go, I've been asking people to do something. Uh, I've been asking people to join me in rethinking special education and in asking difficult questions that challenge the status quo of uh, special education in our country. And so I'm asking a similar thing to you. I'm asking that you, from wherever you lead, will join me in demonstrating that kind of courage and persistence to challenge the status quo, to, to rethink anything that puts you uh, from where you lead, and certainly our nation, in a position to best serve the individuals in our care. Uh, so I think I'm gonna kind of conclude here. Uh, I, I don't wanna run out of time, and I wanna be sensitive to that, but, but I want you to know that I am proud of the progress that we have made in our country since Congress uh, passed public law 94142, you know, over 40 years ago, now the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act. So I am incredibly proud of the progress we've made. But part of being proud of the progress we've made is to remain committed to working collaboratively and differently with each other to make sure that each individual with a disability has what they need, when they need it, to be successful and prepared for their next right step. And I'll leave you with this. Every individual in this room, maybe personally, because you're an individual, with a disability or, or face some other barrier to um, the success that you envision in your life. Every individual in this room, organizations in this room, um, your states, your local areas or entities, um, we as a nation, we all have a stake in the success of individuals with disabilities. And I wanna leave you with this, while we all have a stake in the success of individuals with disabilities, I think you'll agree with me that no one has more of a stake in their success than they do. And we are committed, and I am committed, to working with you on their behalf. So thank you very much for your time. Thank you. I, I just, before um, the Assistant Secretary departs, I just want to personally thank you. Um, we had the opportunity to come on some particular issues that we at Respectability are concerned about. Um, which is particularly transition from school to work, programs that are proven like Project Search and Bridges to Work and other high expectations for seamless employment. And we had a very lengthy conversation about children of color with disabilities and English language learners with, with disabilities. We were particularly concerned about suspensions and ab absenteeism and low expectations around students of color and English language learners. We felt that you listened very, um, very acutely to our concerns on those issues. And we very, very much appreciate your two core agenda items, which is the high expectations for all students, regardless of their background and ability status, and your desire for collaboration across the different groups to solve these very 
difficult challenges. So Assistant Secretary Collette, we're really delighted that you were here with us today. Yeah.